Well, one of the things I certainly say to everyone at Gensler is be relaxed. Everything isn't going to work all the time. And that is certainly true today. We have a, we're a, a very informal group. COFES is a very informal place. As you can see, sometimes when you take PowerPoints off PCs and put them on apples, they aren't always going to work. Certainly that PDF didn't work at all. What I really like about COFES is the really smart people that are here. I come here, I always leave stimulated and with a new focus, a new, a new place to put my attention. And that to me is the real goal of this, is to share as much as we can share. I hereby declare this a no greenwashing zone. You know, let's, let's try and, and speak honestly and as openly as we possibly can with each other. I know it's difficult. You know, I work for a very good company. I like them very much, but I know that we're challenged to really do high efficiency buildings. Sometimes we're challenged because of our own skill sets. Sometimes we're challenged because of our clients. So let's be honest with each other. You know, we've got a lot of hard work in front of us. I am not the director of sustainability. I am the director of sustainable design systems. Gensler is so big, we, have, we can't keep track of our directors of sustainability. I think we've got there are four, four or five. I'm not 100% sure right now. And I work back and forth between them, who are focused on projects, and our information technologies. So I'm, I'm a firm-wide resource, more of a strategy person that's trying to make this stuff happen. I'm trying to change the organization. And I've been a change agent all of my life. And it's been a struggle. It's been very difficult to get change to happen. I've got almost three decades at this. And I have to say that last year, I was so pleased to see the presentation that Peter Marks put on about blind spotting. And I think this is really critical because all of us have blind spots. And when we're dealing with this issue of sustainability, the blind spots really come out. And it's a very challenging topic to have a conversation about. So we need to remind ourselves as we're going through the conversations today to be careful we don't get mired down in some of the kinds of debates that we can have and stay focused on what it is that we can potentially do and, and how we can help each other out. What Peter said at the conclusion of the presentation was so powerful because the scale at which we're now making decisions with this biased human brain that we have is now able to impact not just the whole world but the future of the world as well. And, and so I'm going to bounce back and forth on a few things that Peter said that I think are very important to provide some continuity with last year. In particular, and I think this is so, so critical, and Peter shared this with Brad, and Brad shared it with me, and then I had it in my presentation two years ago, and Peter had it in his presentation. And this gentleman, Dietrich Dorner, wrote this wonderful book, and it's all about simulation and sustainability. It's about how we can use computers to simulate complex systems. And what you really learn, and what Peter's blind spotting conversation is about, is that we as human beings are really good at certain things. I mean, you think about the Olympics. I mean, think about how good we are at, at, at sliding one of those stones down the ice and getting it to land just in the right spot. Or, or you know, the skiers. I mean, we're so good at that. But complex systems with many interacting variables, this brain is terrible at. And that's one of the places where computing technology can really help us. OK, the problem is immense. It is huge. People will focus on different aspects of it. You might be a peak oil person. You might be a person that is a global warming person. You might be a water person. Um, you might be a biofeedback person. The challenge is it goes back to Dietrich Dorner and, and, and Peter Marks. It's all of these variables interacting at the same time with each other. And we just have a terrible time teasing that apart. And then we have this oxymoron, sustainable growth is really kind of what everybody's about. Let's just keep growing this economy. The problem is this brain just doesn't recognize the limits of the physical systems that we're living within. And I'm not going to go into this too deeply. I'm just trying to get it back into our brains as we're starting these conversations today. Because think about it. Think about that deep, 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 deep blue ocean out there which appears infinite as a supply of food and as a, as a pollution sink. Think about that atmosphere, which is equally infinite. And then look at that slide. Do you know what that is? If you took all of the water on Earth and you put it into a sphere, that is the scale of the water compared to Earth. 
And then you begin to realize that is not an infinite source of food if we keep taking food out of it at a, beyond a sustainable rate, nor is it an infinite source of a pollution sink. The same thing is true of the atmosphere, which is just a little bit larger. But that begins to put things into proportions, proportions which the human brain does not perceive. And Herman Daly has just written so eloquently about this, I can't recommend his book more. But when we formed our ethical systems, when we formed our economical systems, Earth was really large. We had lots of resources. We had very few people. And everything has flipped. And we as technologists believe we're going to be able to use technology to manage this. I don't buy it. I'm a, enough of a technologist to know I don't trust technology. And we're right up against the boundaries. We see it right now in diminishing access to energy, diminishing access to resources. And so what's left ends up being super critical. And what Michael is going to be talking about today in terms of life, life cycle inventory analysis is about really understanding how the economy is reaching into and getting those impacts out of that out of the natural world, natural capital, if you will. And I'm really looking forward to what Michael is going to be saying to us this morning. Now, this comes from oh, it's the uh, Natural Step Network. They call it the funnel metaphor, but it just fits so well into what Doc talks about, which is compression. And I really like this idea. We're going to come back to this briefly, and I'm going to keep moving fast. But the notion is we just have growing demand of, obviously, China, India. You all know the story. And we have diminishing resources, which is you know, a world that is finite. And that is funneling down, and our options as we move through time are diminishing. This is the world of compression. This is the world that we're moving into. This, I think, is the big change that all of our organizations really have to come to grips with. This isn't going to, we aren't going to just keep growing at 2 and 3% per year, I don't think. This is my opinion. I think we're coming up against the limits now. And I think we've kind of topped over that with this global recession that we've just gone into. Gensler doesn't, we don't think we're going to ever be moving as fast as we were moving two years ago. At least not with that throughput. And that's the key, is to change from thinking about growing throughput to thinking about growing quality. That's the key. So just to finish off that notion of compression, even though we're turning towards alternative energy sources, the issue is, we're going down the energy return on investment scale. All of these alternatives give us less energy back than what we used to get out of this wonderful petroleum, which in the 1930s was over 100 to 1 energy return on an energy investment. By the 80s, global oil was in the range of 20 to 1. The tar sands are debatable that they'll ever return more energy than you actually invest in them were you to actually measure all of the energy going into them. And then, of course, we have the issue of biofeedback. This concern is growing. I'm not going to go through this in, deep, in, in great depth, but I think this is important, and this is one of my theses. I believe we do have to speak to the facts, and I'm not afraid of trying to frighten people. And I think we need to frighten people, because this is, this, if this is possible, if this is possibly true, then we really have something to worry about and act upon. And that is the notion that we have got to stop this by 2 degrees Celsius. Because the worry is we're going to kick into a we're going to cross over a tipping point, and there's a potential that the Amazonian rainforest will collapse, dumping more carbon into the atmosphere, immediately accelerating us to a three-degree world. And if we hit a three-degree world, they're worried is that we're going to start thawing the permafrost. That's going to release a whole bunch more, which possibly kicks us into a six-degree world without even knowing about it. And if we hit a six-degree world, the geological record says the last time it went up six degrees, we lost between 75 and 95 percent of the life on Earth. Now, that's frightening. What are the odds of that happening? I don't know. One in 100? One in 20? One in two right now? I don't know. But if that's possible, we really have something to be worried about. And the precautionary principle would suggest moving quickly. It does not seem surprising to me that six degrees Celsius would be the difference between a healthy planet and a dead planet when that same temperature range is the difference between a healthy person and a dead person. Since we come from this planet, I see that as sort of being somewhat poetic. And James Hansen said, and it's totally separate. The previous gentleman, Linus, was sort of a, a, a scientific synthesizer. Hansen is a real scientist. He's our leading climate scientist. And he said, this is our number one priority. Do this first. If you do this, and mind you, he said this in 2005, then, and you'll have to excuse me for the technology here, 
you know, if you curtail CO2 emissions, all infrastructure be built in the next decade, then focus on growing you know, the work, then focus on the other greenhouse gases. And if you do that, then you can focus on designing and developing energy technologies that yield a cleaner atmosphere and stable climate. And in a lot of ways, we're going about this backwards. We can't deal with this right now in terms of our policies. So we're sort of pursuing the green strategies while we, while we continue to release the CO2, which potentially puts us into this tipping point issue. So that's the scary part. That's, I'm done with the scary part. And I do sometimes do that to audiences in a more extended way and really you know, can, can depress people. But I think it's important because I don't think just speaking to the opportunity motivates people. Okay? Just speaking to economic opportunity isn't necessarily enough to motivate people. People are motivated by fear. But they can also be shut down by fear. And what Peter said with respect to blind spotting is there's a huge potential to get the future a little bit better. We can do a lot better. And I think this is really important to us because clearly I think that our politicians are failing us. And quite frankly, I think our scientists are failing us. And so it's people like you in this room that are engineers, that are scientists, that are designers, that are educators, that can really take this out into your organizations and make a heck of a difference. So Peter said, we've got huge potential to get the future better. And to me, it's about systems thinking, which says, you know, we're not very good at systems thinking. We tend to react to what's happening. But where design comes in and where this group comes in is really at this notion of understanding the systemic structures that occur between our organizations as we reach out into our, our um, supply chain, for example. And then ultimately, getting down to really what's underneath it all, which is how we think, which again goes back to what Peter was talking about. This is an example of whole systems thinking where you literally have to redo a whole system. You know, we're, we're at sort of civilization 1.0, and we evolved into that. Now we've got to take it from civilization 1.0 to civilization 2.0. And all of you know that's a much more complicated process. So the notion here is that you have to change whole systems. Again, my apologies for the slides. That'll be the last time. There are four different specific elements of this system that were studied. It's from a Harvard Business Review article. It's a very good article. I recommend it. But what I really like is what Danella Meadows said. Now, Danella Meadows, this was written posthumously. It's a wonderful book. What's that? That's difficult. It is difficult. She had an editor. This is also, so it, it is difficult. Um, but what I pulled out of her book, and she's a, she was a brilliant woman, was, was these 12 leverage points and systems. And what I find so interesting, and I talked to John Kennedy at, at Autodesk about this. You know, as an architect, I really want to get out there and fix up all this existing infrastructure. Well, the existing infrastructure is really low on the list of what you can do to change a system. That's our stock and flow structures. It turns out that if you want to change a system, you've got a lot more power if you're up here at information flows and providing feedback. And I know that in our buildings, we'll get a lot more energy efficiency if we just give the occupants of those buildings better feedback on how their behavior is impacting the energy use. We'll get a huge gain from that. And it'll be cheap compared to what we have to do to fix an envelope. So we really have to think. We have to get our priorities right. And we have to really think about this. And what's really, of course, what I like is the fact that the key, again, comes back to how we think, which goes back to what Peter was saying. And this is a challenge. And this is a challenge I face inside of my organization. It's a challenge all of you will face inside of your organizations as well. But <clears throat> to close this, while I really do try to scare the hell out of people, I also try to tell them there's a better way. There's a better future. There are better, there's a better way to live our lives than where we're living them right now. And uh, Scott, I think, is going to speak to this. I'm really looking forward to this. This is something that we've grown to believe. We see the future as a world that is relocalizing. And we're a global company. And our goal is to begin to help relocalizing our communities because we're moving from trying to prevent climate change to adapting to it while diminishing its impacts. And relocalizing our communities is one of the keys to doing that. And this is a critical issue here, where in LEED, we're encouraged to purchase things within 500 miles of a project. First of all, getting the information about what's within 500 miles is critical. And secondly, if you think about it, we spent the last two decades outsourcing everything to way further than 500 miles away. And if there was ever an opportunity in this country to begin to relocalize, it's to start getting smart, sustainable, distributed manufacturing and transportation systems back in place that are relocalized getting our food systems relocalized, 
Most importantly, getting our economies relocalized so they don't get pulled down in a global recession. These are the kinds of strategies which I think are, are going to take us forward in the future. And as architects, we understand how to do this. So, I mean, we know how to make new buildings that are more efficient. We're challenged sometimes to do that in the current economic models, but we know how to do it. Of course, it, we also go back to the issue of we have a huge physical stock out there which is just throwing money up the roof. And so we've got a big challenge in terms of transforming that stock, but we know how to do it. And we certainly don't see any people talking today about what our homes really should be, you know, as opposed to the McMansions that they are. And we know how to remake our infrastructure. We know we need to deal with water. You know, we know that we know how to do it. And we know that we need to make our products much more sustainably. And, and again, life cycle inventory is critical to that. I know Terry and, and others are going to be speaking about that this morning as well. So, and, and Prasad, of course. However, and this is my closing point, all of that is great. You know, so we've got the fear and we've got the vision. But the challenge now, and I think this is really what Doc speaks about, is our opportunity to go and remake this infrastructure that's in the United States and to relocalize is very much going to, you know, we're, we're in this world of compression and we're in it right now. And we've certainly have been in it for the last couple of years. How do we make these changes? And, I, and, and as I was reading Doc's book, I have to say I was really struck by this concept of the vigorous learning organization in this context of sustainability. It's a very stimulating set of ideas. So the goal is for all of us to have a conversation with each other, to find other people that are potential complements to us that we might want to interact with, Maybe as a group, we're going to find something that we want to do together. Maybe a few of you will find things that you want to do together. We'll see what comes out of this. The real goal is to be open, to explore with each other, see what kinds of opportunities are available, and just have a set of good conversations and a good time. And then to take those conversations back out into the Congress and into COFES as a whole, and to learn as much as we can. And that's, that's it. Does anyone have any questions, thoughts on anything I just said? Did I leave you all speechless? I'm so sorry. Come on, somebody. Okay. Brad, do you have any?